Okay, good morning, everyone. Welcome back. Uh, just a few housekeeping notes before we dive back into uh, evolutionary robotics. Uh, I pegged the attendance sheet there. Can you actually click on that link in the schedule? Has anyone managed to do that? Okay. I will, um, for those that just arrived, I will put this back up on the screen and I will leave this embedded in the schedule for a couple minutes after class. So if you didn't get to it yet, that's great. Question? Can you zoom in on that? I can try. I can try. Can you see that? Yes, right here. Okay. The projector's working a little better this morning, but there's no marker for me to write it up on the board, so man never enters the same river twice. All good? Going once, going twice, okay. Okay, I'm glad to see that some of you returned uh, and hopefully submitted assignment one. Uh, pretty easy going, right? Anybody have any installation issues? Couple people, okay, if you still are having installation issues, please be sure to see Krishna or myself as soon as possible so you don't fall too far behind. Krishna, the TA, is here in person today. There he is, that's Krishna, okay. All right, um, so as promised, uh, assignment one was due last night. I will just very briefly give you an idea about what you can expect for assignment two. As you probably figured out, as long as you don't have any installation issues, things are pretty straightforward in assignment, two, uh, assignment one. Things will probably also be pretty straightforward for you in assignment two. Things will start to accelerate a little bit in assignments three, four, five. And again, leave yourself plenty of time for assignments six, seven, eight, nine, and 10. Okay, so uh, in uh, in PyBullet, which is the in PyBullet, which is the simulator we're going to be using for this course, you're going to be constructing your robots out of six basic building blocks: links, which are the physical objects that make up the robot and also make up the environment in which the robot exists. Links, and this week you're going to be adding an assignment to joints, which, as the name implies, connect pairs of links together. The shoulder, the lower arm link is jointed to the upper arm link, which is jointed to the torso and so on. We're going to talk a little bit about joints in a moment. There's some uh, issues here about absolute and coordinate, uh, absolute and relative coordinate systems. PyBullet uses both. It's a little bit non-intuitive at the beginning, so I suggest you spend some time. I'm moving the slides and I haven't shown you anything yet. Hold on one second. There we go. Okay. Okay, assignment two, you're going to be adding joints to connect the links that make up your uh, robot. We're going to talk a little bit in a moment about absolute and re relative coordinate systems because PyBullet uses both. It's a little bit non-intuitive, takes a little bit of getting used to, so I suggest you set aside some time this week to get familiar with the way in which you specify the absolute and relative positions of links and joints in PyBullet. Once you get that under your belt and it becomes intuitive, it'll be much, much easier in the weeks to come as you alter the body uh, of your robot. Okay, so let's talk about absolute and relative coordinate systems for a moment. Okay. So in, uh, you'll see there's a link to this slide deck in assignment two to help you get an understanding of how absolute and relative coordinate systems work. So far, you've been specifying uh, links in PyBullet with absolute coordinates, right? Pretty straightforward. They're absolute to, they're absolute to the world. Uh, so this particular block here is placed 0.5 units of distance above the ground, and vertical height here is uh, Z. If we were to create this particular robot here made up of six uh, links and five joints connecting them together, we would specify the original link with absolute coordinates and then a joint that connects that link to that link with absolute coordinates. This joint is sitting Z equals one distance above the ground. This second link is sitting 1.5 units above the ground, and so on. Yeah? Okay. It's 
pretty straightforward. This is, would be the simplest way to do things, which is to specify absolute coordinates for everything in PyBullet. That is not the way that PyBullet does things. So I'm going to just give you a sense for how this works. The very first link that you add to your robot is a special link. It's known as the root link. How many of you have studied the tree data structure? Pretty much everybody, I think. Not quite everyone. OK, so remember how trees work. There is a root. And from the root, there are a bunch of branches. And at the bottom of those branches are children. Robots are specified in PyBullet as a tree. We have a root link, which is the, the root, obviously. Then we have, in this case, a joint, which is connecting this branch link, this branch link to this root link with this joint here. This joint is the first joint that we're adding to our robot. It is uh, the first joint in your system has an absolute coordinate associated with it. As we move on and you add more links and more joints to your robot, those are going to have relative coordinate systems. So the second and subsequent links that you add, so here's the second uh, link that we're adding, it has a position that is relative to its upstream joint. As we connect, as we create a tree, we have the root, and then we have branches which are connecting downstream to the root. If we're at the bottom of the tree and we travel up the tree towards the root, we are traveling upstream. So when you are adding a new link and you connect it to an upstream link with a joint, uh, that joint has a relative position to its upstream joint, and so does the link. So this link has an upstream joint. The root link does not have an upstream joint. There is nothing upstream. By definition, there is nothing upstream of the root. It has an absolute coordinate. We add, imagine we continue here and we add uh, this third, we add this third link here, and we're going to connect it with a joint to this particular link. If we follow this sequence here, we have this third link which is attached by this joint to this link. This link is attached to this link with this joint. So this second link that we're adding, which connects the third, uh, sorry, the second joint that we're adding here, which connects the third link to the second link, it, that joint also has an upstream joint, which is this one here. So as you're starting to build out your robot, you might want to draw something like this, where we have the root link and a bunch of branches uh, and leaves, and if you follow if you follow the flow up from the link that you're currently adding, and it has an upstream joint, then you're giving it a relative coordinate system. If it does not have an upstream uh, link, it's an absolute coordinate. Okay. So just to see how this goes, if we kept going, we're going to add the third link here. We need to specify the position of the third link. It has an upstream joint, this one. So its position is relative to this joint. Its position is z equals 0.5 above the upstream joint. If we keep going and add this fourth, uh, if we add this fourth link here, we're going to connect it again to this link here, and we're going to connect it with this joint. This joint has an upstream joint, this one. So this joint's position is relative to this joint. This link has a relative position, which is, uh, has an upstream joint. So its position is relative to this upstream joint. It's a little non-intuitive. I've written it several times in the instructions to go over it. Uh, it's a mixture of absolute and relative coordinates. And if we keep going, you can fill in the rest of this. You can make a copy of this slide deck and then replace the question marks with whether you believe it's absolute or uh, re relative or absolute coordinates. Build it into the simulator. One of the nice things about these programming projects is once you implement something, you can usually see it immediately visually, and you'll know whether you got it correct or not. Why the heck would PyBullet make, make your life so complicated? For those that have not reached this point in the assignments, why mix absolute and relative coordinates? 
Why not stick with the obviously more simple case of just specifying all positions with absolute coordinates? Yes? Is it easier in certain scenarios to imagine somebody who's relative to each other as opposed to the grand scheme of the entire simulation? Uh, how they move relative to each other? Yeah, absolutely, right? So a lot of things, as you're starting to build up the robot, it makes more sense of thinking of relationships relative to one another rather than relative to the world as a whole. Most of the robots you're gonna be building are symmetric. There's a very, very good reason why most animals on the planet have bilateral symmetry like us, which is the left side of your body looks like the right side of your body, or radial symmetry like jellyfish, where you look the same all the way uh, around. Symmetry is pretty important. If you're building something that's bilaterally symmetric, it's often easier to think about the shoulder joint as being a little bit to the left of the torso, and the other shoulder being an equal distance away from the torso, but in the other direction. The other reason why PyBullet mixes absolute and relative coordinate systems is it makes it relatively easy to make a swarm of robots. As you've already started to figure out, um, what, uh, what you're doing is writing out a description of the robot to a file, to a URDF file, and simulate reads in that URDF file and simulates the robot that's in that file. You can spit out n different URDF files, and your simulate.py could read in all n of those URDF files. Each of those URDF files might actually encode the exact same robot with one difference, which is the absolute positions of the first link in red there, the red uh, square, and the first joint, the red circle that you see there. So you can basically specify using the absolute coordinates, offset positions of the swarm, and then everything else is the, is the same. Okay, again, this is a little bit of a pain in the butt, takes a while to get used to, practice building different robots with absolute and relative uh, positions. If you're feeling ambitious, if you're feeling ambitious, you can try and use uh, ideas from computer graphics, specifically procedurally generated content, to automatically generate a robot made up of relatively large numbers of links connected together uh, with joints. You're going to practice procedurally generated content uh, at the first part of assignment two, where you're generating, using this idea, you're, you're nesting a bunch of for loops, and in these nested for loops, in the center of these nested for loops is a line that spits out a cube to, in this case, the environment. Makes it relatively easy to build up relatively complex scenes. This might be useful later on when you want to make more complex environments uh, for your robot. So you've got a little bit of time uh, this week to play around with physics engines. Okay. Any questions about any of that before we push on? Yes? Uh, what if we have uh, more than one upstream joint? How do we choose it? What is it? Yep, OK. So if you think about a tree, and I apologize, I don't have something to write on the right board, so I'm going to have to paint a picture in your mind. When you build a tree, you have a root, and then under that, you have a series of uh, additional nodes that are connected to the root, right? In this case, a node equals a link, a physical object that makes up a part of your robot. By definition, any node in a tree only has one immediately upstream uh, joint. So your question might have been, you might have multiple upstream joints, the one that's immediately upstream from you, the one that's upstream from that, and so on. It's the next it's the immediate upstream joint, the one that's connecting you. If I'm link N, it's the one that connects me to my upstream link. Make sense? Yeah, but I'm thinking like, it could be possible to have more than one, like we have many, many nodes, and then all of them connect to like the next one. Ah, uh, yeah, actually that's a great question. So I'm not sure how PyBullet deals with that, but what you're describing is a chain. So imagine we have a, we have a, a tree with a whole bunch of these branches, which are objects connected by joints, links connected by joints. And then somewhere down in the tree, you take two of those links and you attach them with a joint. You now have connected a loop. 
Physics engines have a very, very hard time dealing with what are known as kinematic chains. This object is connected to this object, which is connected to this, connected, 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 back again. The reason why, maybe we'll leave that discussion, we're going to talk about physics engines uh, on Thursday or maybe next Tuesday. Please remind me of this point. When we talk about physics engines, we'll talk about why it's so difficult for them to simulate kinematic chains. Luckily, for pretty much every robot you could possibly imagine, you won't need a kinematic chain, thankfully. Okay, some physics engines deal with them better than others. I don't actually know how PyBullet does. You, someone can give it a try if they want. Yep? When I was doing homework and we put the two blocks directly on top of each other, it would say an absolute starting position. Yep. Why did it go, I think it went on the x-axis when they got to the part instead of on like the y or the z. Okay, uh, when they're directly on top of one another? Yeah, when they're perfectly on top of each other. Uh, so on top or interpenetrating, like they have the same position? In the same position. Ah, okay, when they have the same position, Again, we're going to talk about this more when we talk about physics engines, but for now, if you place two objects with positions that causes them to interpenetrate, the physics engine does not like that, right? It doesn't make sense uh, in real life, so it will try and resolve that issue. The way that the physics engine does that is by applying force to push the objects apart. If their positions are exactly the same, then it's kind of arbitrary. If it pushes them apart on the x-axis, it, it doesn't matter. Okay. If you place them interpenetrating and one is slightly higher than the other, you should see the upper one go shooting up into the sky, right? It's just the physics engine trying to fix something that is physically unrealistic. And sometimes it fixes it realistically and sometimes it fixes it unrealistically. Any other questions? You're all gonna become experts with the uh, the follies and foibles of physics engines as we go along. Okay, so back to uh, lecture. We are working our way through about an hour crash course in the history uh, of AI. The history of AI and robotics more or less dates back to the, uh, be the end of the Second World War when the very first computers and the very first robots were made. But we started our discussion much earlier than that. We started back in the uh, 1600s with Rene Descartes, who fortunately or unfortunately for us here in the West, cut body and brain, or in the case of Descartes, body and soul in two, which has become known over the centuries as Cartesian dualism. And you're gonna see Cartesian dualism warps the way that we think about thinking and the way we go about trying to build intelligent machines. One of the things that evolutionary robotics tries to do is to fix this gap, to reconcile Cartesian dualism. Okay, we jumped, uh, we jumped forward into the 1930s with the Turing machine. We went to 1956 down the road to Dartmouth, the very first use of the word artificial intelligence. We talked a little bit about why intelligence is important in the first place. There is an engineering aim, which is to try and create intelligent and useful machines, but there is an also deeper goal, especially in robotics, is to understand the nature of intelligent behavior. We're gonna see robots used in this course as engineering tools, but also as scientific tools. Uh, we jumped to 1966. We saw the very, very first chatbot, Eliza. We talked a little bit about the Turing test. We talked last time about Searle's response to the Turing test, which in my personal opinion just made things more confusing, not less. We ended last time in the 1980s with Valentino Breitenberg's book, Vehicles. Breitenberg studied, studied the uh, brains of fruit flies. At, in the 1980s, a lot of people thought that fruit flies were performing differential calculus. Breitenberg sat down and tried to come up with a simpler explanation for taxis behavior, T-A-X-I-S, taxis behavior, how animals sense and move towards good things like rotting fruit or away from bad things like the odor of a predator. We looked at uh, one of these quote unquote vehicles, these hypothetical machines, which had nothing more than two light sensors on the front, two wheels on the back, and contralateral connections, contralateral across the body. 
left sensor is attached to the right wheel, right sensor attached to the left wheel, and we saw that with this very, very simple robot, maybe we don't get cognitive behavior, maybe we don't get intelligent behavior, but we get the rudiments of useful behavior, what's often known as protocognition, or sensory, sensor motor coordination. These are some of the building blocks on which, on which more complex behaviors are built. You are all in the process of chasing a, a degree, a bachelor's degree or a master's degree. This simple creature here is chasing the light. Are those behaviors really that different? One is an elaboration, potentially, of the one underneath. This one is very physical, nuts and bolts. Chasing after an advanced degree involves a lot of abstraction, but possibly these more abstract behaviors that we feel only us special humans are capable of, perhaps they rest on a foundation of these simpler protocognitive behaviors. That is still an open hypothesis. As I mentioned last time, the study of intelligence is kind of the Wild West. There's a lot of questions out there, not so many answers. Okay. Uh, Breitenberg talked about, yes, question. I was thinking about that analogy. So like, if something like moving forward to the degree, it would be like every move you make gets you closer to that degree. But what if there was like a move that you needed to get farther away to, to get a, like a faster path? Like it was like a nonlinear way of getting towards the degree. That's, that's a great question, right? The path to get from here, quote unquote here, whatever that means, to there, which is achieving an advanced degree, you mentioned going towards and going away. We're already now using spatial language for something that is purely abstract, right? Most of achieving an advanced degree is quiet, passive, abstract thought, maybe some note-taking and scratching some stuff on paper. Why are already we talking about towards and away? We're gonna actually talk about this later in the course. There are hints in human languages, including English, that abstract thought, like achieving an advanced degree, is in our minds we are using metaphors like moving towards, moving away, I have to make a right turn, I have to back up and try again. There is some deep connection between abstract thought and physical action. And we're gonna explore that a lot in this course. Yeah, great question. Okay. I wish we had more time in this course to go through more of the vehicles. This is, I think, the last one we're going to look at. Uh, this robot is the same as the one we just saw. Two light sensors on the front, two wheels on the back, but now we have IPSA lateral connections. I-P-S-I, IPSA lateral connections, same side connections. Left sensor attached to left wheel, right sensor attached to right wheel. If we approach this robot with a flashlight from the front right, how is this robot going to respond? It's going to, turn away from the right. it's going to turn away. There is more light falling on the right sensor at this, this instant in time, which means the right wheel is going to turn faster, and it's going to take, take a small turn away from the light. What happens at the next instant in time, after it's made this small left turn? How is it going to behave at the next instant in time? Absolutely. So let's assume we're in a dark room and there's just this single flashlight. It's going to turn away from the flashlight and then slow down a little bit. Let's assume that these light sensors on the front are omnidirectional, so it can quote-unquote see the light that is now almost behind it. What happens if I start chasing this robot with the light? What is it going to do? The robot's going to start running away. It's going to run away, right? This is, this is the coward. It's afraid of lights. It's not like the aggressor that hates, right? Obviously, it's afraid of the light. We hate, we love, we fear. This thing clearly doesn't, right? We are different. We are not Breitenberg machines. Hold on to that thought for dear life. Does it not? Does it not what? Hate or fear? I mean, the machine should... Great question. Good question, right? 
If you read this book, for most people, and I've sort of given you the punchline, I apologize for that, most come in very confident, right? And laughing like many of you are laughing right now, chuckling along with how silly this is. Clearly they don't love and hate and fear. We do, we're special. By the end of this book, for many people, they're no longer laughing, right? It's not so clear. It's not so clear whether these machines don't love, fear, hate. And it's also not so clear that we do. It feels like we do. It seems obvious. It's not even worth discussing. We hate, we love, we fear. It's real, it exists. Emotions are a thing. Thinking about thinking is misleading. This is one of the most fun and one of the most unsettling things about the study of intelligent machines. A lot of the things that you feel when you introspect, when you metacogitate, you think about thinking, seem obvious, they feel like they're real, but a lot of scientific advances are suggesting they may not be as obvious as they seem subjectively. Okay, I'm not trying to convince you that the vehicles do or don't, or that you do or don't. I hope you come to your own conclusions throughout uh, this semester. Okay. Let's move forward. So uh, in the 1980s, at the same time that Breitenberg was writing and publishing his book, there was a movement underway in what was now known as artificial intelligence, which is up until the 1980s, as we saw with Eliza in the 1960s, it was clear that what is going on in the human brain is some big set of if-then-else statements. But as we started to understand the neurobiology of uh, a mammalian nervous tissue better, it became clear that this thing was a huge mass of spaghetti. There were these special neurons, or these special cells called neurons, and they had branches and they connected to a bunch of others, which looked very different from the uh, computer circuitry that was being built in the 60s, 70s, and 80s, and still is built today. So if the brain had this very different architecture from computers, maybe the quote unquote code running inside brains is also very different from the code that was running in computers at, at, at this time. Maybe what the brain is, was doing is not a set of if then else statements. Maybe the brain was performing computations using all of these neurons in parallel. Some of you know about neural networks. Imagine you hadn't heard of neural networks before. It's a very difficult leap from thinking about writing code as a bunch of if-then-else statements to writing code, which are numbers that are flowing through things, neurons or nodes, and those numbers are flowing along these arrows or connectors and being combined with numbers at other nodes. That was the thinking that was going on in AI in the 1970s and 1980s. In the 1980s, Jeff Hinton at the University of Toronto wrote down an algorithm known as the backpropagation of error, which if you've ever taken an AI course, you've heard of the backpropagation of error uh, 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 algorithm. In the 1980s, it worked terribly, and Hinton was laughed out of most AI conferences at the time. This thing about neural networks and backpropagation of error seemed silly, it didn't work. AI researchers were convinced in the 1980s and moving into the 1990s that however AI was gonna be achieved, this was not the way to do it. This seemed relatively silly. Okay, I just wanna pause with neural networks for a moment. This is not a neural networks course. We're gonna talk about neural networks in a little bit more detail next week. We're gonna talk about them just enough for you to understand and build them into your own robots. Biological brains on the left, they absorb sensory information through the body. They transform that sensory information with internal state, and then they push uh, current, or volt current voltage out to muscle fibers, which results in muscle movement, which results in changes in the sensors, and around and around we go. Sounds a little bit like a Turing machine, input combined with external state, push to output. We're gonna connect this thing with the environment. On the right-hand side, we have artificial neural networks as they were written down in the 1980s. There was no body, there was no environment, there was just this naked model of the brain, and we as the researchers would provide input to the neural network. Pictures of hand-drawn characters, 
Today it's pictures and videos of kitties from uh, YouTube. And then we expect some kind of output uh, at, the, uh, at the bottom of the neural network. We're gonna use neural networks inside our robots where more like the brain, the robots are gonna extract sensor values from their virtual environment, push those sensor values through their neural network controller. The values arriving at the output layer, those numbers are treated as desired forces that are sent to the motors that are connected to the joints, which you're gonna be implementing this week, that causes your robot to move. Okay. Okay, so let's move forward into the 1990s. Um, the 1990s was uh, one of the, well, actually the deepest of all the AI winters. So there was a lot of hope about uh, AI starting in the 1950s. It's gonna take us one summer to solve AI. Didn't quite pan out. The longer and longer things went on with no progress led to a winter in about the 1970s. There seemed to be some progress going on in AI in the 1980s, but it never panned out and uh, uh, AI was plunged into the 1990s. Hans Moravec was a very famous roboticist in the 1980s. He was asked about why these winters keep occurring. Part of the reason is intellectual. We think about thinking, it seems obvious what we're doing, all we need to do is write it down in, in code. But thinking about thinking is misleading. When you come to actually try and create an intelligent machine based on your own intuition about what's going on in here, it's very difficult. The other reason AI winters happen is because of uh, funding in the US. So Hans Moravec said, uh, back in the, uh, the AI summers, many researchers were caught up in a web of increasing exaggeration. They made promises to DARPA, which is the Defense Advanced Research Projects Agency, the research wing of the Department of Defense. Uh, they made promises to DARPA that were much too optimistic. Uh, what they delivered always stopped considerably short of what they had promised. But the next time they asked for money from the government, they couldn't promise less than what they asked the first time, so they promised more and more, and you get the equivalent of an economic bul bubble, but it's an intellectual bubble, and eventually that bubble pops. We are currently in the middle of an extremely high summer in AI, right? Take any newspaper uh, on the planet this morning, somewhere in that paper there's an article about AI and what it's going to do this week, next week, next month, next year, right? One of the things that AI researchers always worry about is when is summer going to end? Are the current promises that are being made about deep learning, which is the current fashionable approach to creating intelligent machines, what happens if some of those promises are a little bit over-exaggerated and people start to realize that reality is not matching up with the promises? Perhaps there'll be less funding, which isn't a promise, which isn't a problem for you. It's only a problem for AI researchers. But clearly our economic well-being seems caught up with optimism about AI in general at the moment. What happens if that optimism goes away? Okay. Uh, luckily, at the moment, we don't need to worry about that. We're still in an AI high summer. So as I mentioned, it's kind of a, an irony of research of AI and science in general. 1980s, you asked any AI researcher, 99 out of 100 of them would say, this is the wrong way to do things. You, took, you take a poll today, 99 out of 100 will say, this is the way to do things, right? One of the problems with neural networks in the 1980s is that they were not deep. You could not add a whole bunch of layers between the sensor layer, which in this uh, cartoon is on the left here, and the output layer, which is on the right. Hinton and some of his students and some others kept working through the 1980s, through the 90s, with no funding whatsoever into the 2000s. And in 2006, they showed a way that you can successfully propagate error so mistakes in classification on the right-hand side, you can propagate those errors all the way back through many, many layers to the left-hand side and figure out where things went wrong. The main advance that was made was to figure out that you should arrange these little local computations as a hierarchy. The left-hand components should be calculating local things in an image, for example, 
like lines. And as you move from left to right, higher and higher in the hierarchy, those local computations should be doing computations on local features, combining local features into slightly less local and slightly more global features. Uh, this is known as convolution. We don't have time to go into this uh, in this course. The point I just want to make here is AI uh, requires patience. There can be long periods in which nothing is happening. In this case, it took decades upon decades to get back propagation of error to really work well. Okay. We're in an AI summer, but there are some worrying signs that fall may be approaching. Some of you may have seen these before. Um, here is an antagonistic attack. So when the robot uprising happens and uh, you and your family fear for your lives, make sure you figure out something smart to write and paste it on your chest and you should be perfectly fine. Not human probably will, will do pretty well, right? Not only, not only was this uh, deep neural network fooled in the top right, but it's very confident in its guess. And this is particularly dangerous. It's funny in this case, not so funny when you put this into an autonomous car that's out on the roads with pedestrians. We all make mistakes and we're learning that machines inevitably are going to have to make mistakes as well. If you are an intelligent human being, hopefully you always have a little bit of skepticism about your own confidence, right? One of the most scary things is a human or a machine that is wrong and is absolutely convinced that it is not wrong. This is a big open problem uh, in AI. Uh, just for fun, uh, you can actually go to Eliza. Uh, if you Google Eliza, you can actually talk to the original Eliza from 1966. Here's me having a conversation with Eliza. Eliza says, hello, I'm Eliza. I said, hello, I am Josh. She said, how long have you been Josh? I said, all my life. She said, tell me more. I asked her a question to try and throw her off guard. How many eyes does a giraffe have? And she answered my question with a question. What answer would please you the most? Very profound. Someone asked GPT-3, which is the current reigning champion chatbot, the, exactly, the exact same question. How many eyes does a giraffe have? And it came back with the right answer. A giraffe has two eyes. Excellent. We've made progress over the last, what is that, 40, 50 years. Great. How many eyes does my foot have? Your, eye, your foot has two eyes. How many eyes does a spider have? A spider has eight eyes. How many eyes does the sun have? Has one eye. I'm not sure whether we've made any progress with chatbots since 1966. You can go and talk to GPT-3 and you can go and talk to Eliza on the web. You do, do some comparison shopping, which is better? Okay, again, just a reminder that if you squint one way, it looks like we were making breathtaking rapid progress in AI. Our roads are gonna be covered with autonomous cars any day now. You squint another way, and it's actually hard to see that we've made any progress at all. I'm not trying to convince you on any one of these views, just again, a reminder that thinking about thinking is hard. And since thinking about thinking is hard, it's, it's uh, very, very challenging to actually create increasingly intelligent machines. Okay. In this course, we're now gonna zoom in on one particular part of the landscape of AI and robotics, which is evolutionary robotics. There's a lot of different approaches to robotics. We're gonna talk a little bit about swarms and talk a little bit about uh, swarms a little bit. Uh, developmental robotics, we'll touch on this a little bit later. This is development as in human or child development. We can view robots as we're going to in this course as swarms of evolving machines. You can also look at, at an individual robot as a human baby. It's got a body, it doesn't know how to use it, it doesn't know what self is, it doesn't know what all this stuff out here is. How do young humans scaffold or bootstrap their own learning and the blossoming of their own intelligence and their own ability to grapple independently with everything the world throws at us as we age? Can we take some of those ideas which come from developmental psychology, the study of human children, and build that into robotics? 
There is biorobotics, which is to study particular organisms, humans, dogs, jellyfish, uh, birds, and try and build some of those particular mechanisms from those species into robots. That's biorobotics. Industrial robotics, for our purposes, is not that interesting. That's kind of a solved problem. On the other side, we have artificial intelligence. And artificial intelligence obviously also has lots of different approaches to trying to create intelligent uh, machines. We just looked at connectionism, which got started in the 1980s, that the way to reach intelligence is to connect together a lot of local computation. That draw, uh, connectionism and neural networks itself draws on neural science and computational neural science. We're going to see some of that as we go along. Uh, most of you are familiar with machine learning. This is kind of an umbrella term now for any piece of code that learns or improves on its own uh, over time. Data mining has kind of been folded into machine learning recently. Evolutionary computation is a type of uh, search or optimization process. We're going to spend a bit of time talking about evolutionary computation. There's another offshoot here, artificial life. This particular community is kind of a sister community to evolutionary robotics. Artificial life researchers study life in general. And instead of trying to build intelligence into machines, they want to try and build living systems out of machines or build lifelike processes into machines. The slogan for artificial life is to study life as it can be in contrast to biology, which is study of life as it is. Artificial life researchers have made the following bet. If we can simulate or start to build living machines or machines that simulate living processes, that's an important building block on the way to then realizing intelligent machines. If we want to get to intelligent machines, we need to get to lifelike machines first and then intelligent machines. You'll notice that uh, in this cartoon here, there are two major branches. Why? Absolutely, right? So a 400-year-old line of thinking in Western thought still influences how we do things today in AI and robotics. We're going to spend most of this class on the upper right side of this picture. Most of the AI classes that you can take or have taken here at UVM fall on the lower left, right? Everything on the lower left, these are non-embodied approaches. These are usually pieces of code that are imprisoned inside a PC or a laptop or a smartphone. They have little or no ability to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. Every machine on the upper right is embodied. It has a body in some sense. It may not be a physical body. It may be a virtual body. The robots you're building in the physics engine are embodied. They're just not physical. They have virtual or physical bodies with which to push against the world and observe how the world pushes back. We're going to explore, generally speaking in this course, how that feedback loop, push against the world, sensory repercussion coming back. How does that loop, or how might that loop, provide a foundation on which to build up increasingly abstract uh, cognitive behaviors. Okay, any questions about that before we move on to lecture three, embodied cognition? Obviously, that was a, a very, very brief introduction to the history of AI. All good? Okay. Okay, so we're going to explore this idea of embodied cognition by looking at uh, a couple of building blocks of intelligence, like recognizing patterns out in the world. That's an important piece of intelligence. We're going to look at non-embodied and embodied approaches to solving these problems. If we want to create a machine that's good at recognizing patterns, should we create a non-embodied machine or should we create an embodied machine? Okay. Pattern recognition in general is a big, uh, vague problem. Let's sharpen our definition here down to getting a machine to recognize objects in a scene. Where are the edges of an object? This is known in computer uh, vision as the image segmentation problem. When I first taught this course, it used, this slide used to say it is one of the most difficult problems in computer science. 
Deep learning has done a pretty good job at solving the computer vision problem. So it is no longer one of the most difficult problems uh, in the world. However, deep neural networks have paid a pretty heavy price to solve this problem. In order to recognize Marilyn Monroe or the iPod or an Apple or a car or whatever else we wanted to recognize, we need to throw millions and usually billions of images at our deep lear learner, and it needs to spend much, much time and much, much, much carbon to crunch the numbers to learn how to recognize Marilyn Monroe, the car, the iPod, what have you. It's extremely expensive from a time, money, and carbon point of view to get a deep learner to solve this problem. Imagine we trained our children in the following way. As soon as they were born, we chained them to a chair so they were no longer allowed to move. And all we did was show them images of what the world is like and give them some food when they do a good job and maybe withhold some food when they don't do such a great job. Doesn't sound like such a great way to raise our children. That is how we are raising our machines. This is the non-embodied approach. Give them a million images that do not contain Marilyn Monroe and give them another million images that do contain Marilyn Monroe and allow them to figure out how to, how to distinguish between the two groups. Okay, let's look at the same problem, recognizing, learning to recognize patterns in the world, but now we're gonna come at it from an embodied point of view. This is Cog the robot. Um, the name cog has two meanings. It's a machine, it's mechanical. There are actual cogs inside cog's body. And perhaps cog is cogitating. Okay, so here's a cartoon picture of how uh, cog works. As you can see here, cog has just one arm and has uh, two cameras visualized by the little cartoon eyes here. At every point in time, COG is getting back two images from its two cameras. And in this case, the researchers scrubbed out a lot of detail from those two video streams. They removed all the color and they replaced every pixel with a one or a zero. Uh, sorry, they combined the two images together. They removed all of the color and they boiled the numbers in those pixels down to a one and a zero. Zero indicates there was no motion at that particular point in the visual field over the last tenth of a second. A one indicates there is, there was some motion at that point in the visual field over the last tenth of a second. So the little cartoon that you see in the upper right here, all the shaded out regions are areas of no motion and everything that's left unshaded is cog detecting some motion at that point in that part of its visual field at that time. COG was actually a, a developmental robotics approach. So the researchers were treating COG as a baby. COG knew next to nothing about its world. The only thing COG knew is that it could send numbers to its motors. And when it does, in this case, it sends some random numbers to the motors in its arm. In this particular instant in time, Cog sees this big blob move into it, the left part of its visual field. What happens the moment that Cog stops sending commands to those motors? What's the sensory repercussion of stopping that action? The arm disappears. The arm disappears. Let's put ourselves in Cog's shoes. Cog knows nothing about arm, table, bananas. It knows nothing except I can send commands to these things. I'll call them motors. When I do, I see this blob enter my left visual field. And when I stop sending commands to my motors, the blob disappears. I send, start sending commands and the blob reappears. I see this blob of motion. When I stop sending, the blob disappears. What can Cog deduce from that interaction? The motors are responsible for the appearance and disappearance of the blob, right? Responsible. We already have causation. At the beginning of the quote unquote life of this uh, robot baby, it understands that things that it does can cause changes 
in what it sees. Okay. What might it conclude about this particular blob? What is special about this blob? It's part of itself. So at this point, BabyBot says, I'm going to make up a new concept. I'm going to call it self. And the definition of self is written in the language of sensors and motors. If you look up the definition of self uh, in the dictionary, it will not be the following. For COG, self is defined as blobs that appear when I send commands outward and blobs that disappear when I stop sending commands outward. That is, it is defining self as a relationship between what it does and the sensory repercussions of its actions. We are already very far from defining humans as having vaguely this shape and apples as having vaguely round shapes and so on. Okay, so BabyBot has already taken one of the most important steps that early human infants do, which is to discover that there are a small number of things over which you have control. And for now, we're gonna call those things self, and there's a whole bunch of other things that seem to be moving out there in my world, but I can't seem to start or stop any of that motion myself. So I'm going to call that stuff world or other, self and other. Imagine as BabyBot is playing with its arm, sending commands and stopping sending commands, its hand happens to come into contact with the apple placed in front of it. And the moment that it does in this bottom right image, the blob suddenly changes shape. The blob had a more or less constant shape for most of the time, but suddenly there's this other bit on the edge of the blob. Yep? I see the question is, like, how does it remember what codes to send or what the numbers to send? Like, yeah. I guess it doesn't, or like, how does that work? Yeah, good, good question. So I'm kind of oversimplifying here, but imagine that COG is building up a database. It says, I sent numbers seven, three, and four outward. And seven, three, and four become the electrical currents that are sent to the shoulder, elbow, and wrist, let's say. BabyBot doesn't know any of that. All it knows is I sent, I sent commands outward. I sent those three numbers out, and I got this back. Now I'm gonna send zero, zero, zero. The arm stops and the blob disappears. So you can imagine BabyBot building up a database of triplets of numbers and the picture that comes back. And based on subsets of those pairs, like non-zero numbers produce the picture in the top right, and zero, uh, triplets of zeros produce no motion, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put a lasso around that subset and give it a name, self, yeah? So BabyBot still knows nothing about wrist, shoulder, motors, cur electrical current, just knows numbers and resulting pictures. Uh, if it's learning this by like playing and like with like in that way, how does it motivate the bot to play? Like is there like an optimization problem? Like yeah. Like That's a great question, which is a question about motivation. Why should BabyBot do anything at all, right? So this is not a purely automated process, right? The researchers are still in the background somewhere setting some biases in the behavior of, of COG. In this case, it was be motivated to do stuff. You should do stuff rather than not do stuff. The study of motivation in AI and robotics is itself an interesting question. A good survival strategy is be curious, try things, right? But don't be too curious because if you're a baby or a robot just starting out, a lot of the things that you might try are dangerous. They're non-recoverable, right? So again, it's not trivial how much motivation or how much curiosity you should have given your current understanding of self and the world around you. In this case, the researchers kind of bake it in. They make a playful bot. Okay, so let's go back to BabyBot's second discovery. It turns out that suddenly, it turns out that this blob can actually change shape under certain conditions. Let's imagine BabyBot uh, start, keeps pushing and this apple keeps moving and now BabyBot sends 0, 0, 0 to the motors. So the arm stops. What happens from, Baby Bot, uh, from COG's point of view? 
The nickname of this robot is BabyBot, so I keep switching between BabyBot and Cog. Possibly. So maybe when the art, when the hand stops, the apple stops. The apple can like keep moving from the force applied to it. Absolutely. So the apple is round, and it's hard to see from this cartoon, but it's it's likely that the apple keeps moving for half a second, a second after the arm stops. Now Baby Bot is really confused. There's this other thing which I thought was a change in the shape of the blob. But it turns out that there are things that can still be blobs even when I'm sending 0, 0, 0 to my motors. What can BabyBot conclude from that? It might conclude that there are things that are not safe. Absolutely. So it seems that there are other things that are out there. At the beginning of BabyBot's life, and probably in the case of most human babies' life, they're solipsists. Meaning, the only thing I can be sure of is that I exist. Everything else, I have absolutely no idea what's going on out there. Who does that sound like? The only thing I can be sure of at the moment is I exist. When I send commands, the blob appears. When I stop, the blob goes away. Descartes. Sounds like Descartes, right? Kind of interesting. Descartes pops up many, many times in the study of intelligence. Okay. So BabyBot says, all right, I guess there's stuff other than just myself in the universe. I'm going to call all that other stuff uh, other, or world. Let's call it world. There's self and world. Imagine BabyBot keeps moving around, and now it happens to bump into the banana. And now it says, ah, I've seen this before. The self blob suddenly changes shape, and there's this new shape now hanging off the edge of the blob, and I know when I send 0, 0, 0 to my arm, that thing is going to persist for a couple of seconds and then wink out of existence again. I found another piece of the world. Now baby bot is surprised again. It pushes against the banana, and the minute that it stops moving, so does the banana. Uh-oh. Now what can it conclude from that? Possibly is the banana part of itself. There's an important difference between, we're already calling it banana, we're kind of cheating, this new blob and self. What's the difference from Baby Bot's point of view? Banana stays, doesn't disappear when the arm disappears. Uh, well, let's assume that the banana does disappear at the same time that the blob disappears. It acts differently from the apple, but it also acts differently from the self. Let's focus on the difference between the banana blob and the self blob. If baby bot moves away from the banana, that blob doesn't then reappear. Exactly, right? So self, remember that baby bot is pretty comfortable with self. There's always a blob whenever I send non-zero commands. But sometimes when I send non-zero commands, this banana blob doesn't show up. So it's whatever it is, it's part of world. But it seems that there are these two different blobs that exist in world, and they have different properties. This first one, the apple-shaped blob, when I hit it, it persists for a while and then winks out. This other piece of world, when I touch it, it appears, but then it immediately blinks out when I stop moving. So now, back to this question about the difference between the apple blob and the banana blob. From BabyBot's point of view, what can it conclude about the difference between these two things? Let's imagine BabyBot keeps moving about in this pile of fruit. Some of these things roll away when it touches them, like the orange, and other things don't roll away, like the, the, the uh, bundle of grapes. So there's this distinction that is starting to emerge between all the things that exist in world. What is that distinction from BabyBot's point of view? Um, from interacting with the world, there's the world the world is different, right? It, absolutely, right? Not all, not all things in the world are the same, but there's already categories that are appearing. Some things keep moving and some things don't. What can BabyBot conclude from that? 
It's already learned that there is this distinction, but if you were to ask it, what is this distinction? Explain it to me, what would BabyBot say? BabyBot doesn't actually talk. We're kind of speaking metaphorically here. But what can BabyBot distinguish? What can it learn about these two different categories? The shape is different. Some things persist and some things don't. And if I look at those two sets of blobs, there's an interesting pattern. The things that persist seem to have a particular type of shape. I'm going to call that, I'm going to, first of all, I'm going to create this category called shape which is the edge of the blobs. I know there's now a thing called shape, and I'm gonna come up with some features for that uh, category. I'm gonna call it round and not round. And things that are round are persist, and things that aren't round don't persist. I'm gonna come up with one more word. A baby bot is gonna come up with one more word, which is an adverb, which is rollable. When I touch these things, they're rollable, or they admit to rolling. So BabyBot is already starting to discover a lot of structure in its world beyond what our deep neural network is capable of, right? This structure that BabyBot is building up about itself and the world is through interaction. So BabyBot's understanding of the world is relative to it, not relative to our world. We need to tell a deep learner, this is a human being, this is a human female, this is Marilyn Monroe. We impose a lot of the categories on deep learners when we, when we train it to do classification. Human infants and animals and robots, if they're set up in the right way, they are able to autonomously discover their own structure in the world. They can learn the distinction between self and non-self they can learn about the idea of causation. If this happens, then this happens. It can learn about physical properties. Imagine we keep going with baby bot. We allow it to explore the fruit in front of it. What else can it start to learn about its world? It's learned about shape. It's learned about adverbs. Maybe things, some things are harder than others, right? I need to send more non-negative values to get uh, this blob to appear. I'm going to call that concept mass. Some things have greater mass than others. And the definition of mass is not in kilograms. It's defined in terms of BabyBot's relationship with the world. More non-zero motor actions are required. More force is required to produce these particular blobs. Other, other things that BabyBot can learn about its world. Malleable. Mal malleable, right? BabyBot, like a baby, tries to smash everything in its environment. Some of these blobs, BabyBot can actually change their shape. I'm going to call that, BabyBot is going to call that malleability. Uh, it could learn about depth. Depth? How would it learn about depth? Absolutely, right? So these blobs not only can change shape, they can change size. And size happens to be related to a particular set of triplets of numbers, which is drawing towards and drawing away, right? So it's already starting to establish relative position relative to self. For those that are interested in this overall concept of embodied cognition, you can spend hours on this slide. There are hundreds of things that BabyBot can start to learn about the structure of its world just from putting a bowl of fruit in front of it and putting this movement, non-movement filter onto its two cameras. Okay, let's keep going. Let's again, yes, question. Oh, this has actually been done. So there's a citation to the paper here. You can actually Google the title there and actually go and read the research paper itself. It's quite old now, um, but you can see all the things that the researchers tried. COG is actually uh, on display in the Science Museum in Cambridge, Mass. So in the after times when we're all free to travel again, you can actually go see COG uh, in the flesh. Okay. So let's again explore this issue of embodiment by looking at non and embodied approach, approaches to another building block of cognition, which is planning. If you are not able to reason about future events, 
and uh, influence things in the present to produce a good outcome for yourself in the future, you're probably not that intelligent of an organism or a machine. Planning is very important in some of the most abstract games or enterprises that humans have invented, including uh, chess. Uh, it was very exciting uh, a few a while back when D uh, IBM's Deep Blue supercomputer built Gary Kasparov. Uh, be beat Gary K Kasparov. Anybody remember when this was? 78. 30. Close. It was actually the 90s. So not too long ago. Does anybody know how Deep Blue worked? Basic idea? Absolutely. So Deep Blue could basically just outplan Kasparov. It could see more moves ahead. It seems that it could see more moves ahead than Kasparov, right? So it's obvious that to do well at chess, you need to plan far into the future, right? You need to imagine if this happens, then I'll do this. And if that happens, I'll do that. This is non-embodied planning, right? Deep Blue just sits there and cogitates. This is the non-embodied approach to planning. Non-embodied approaches work pretty well for rigidly defined systems like chess. There's only so many moves that you can make. At every instant in time, at every tenth of a second in your life, given the number of independent muscle fibers that exist in your body, there is basically an infinite set of moves, literal moves, you can make. How the heck do we manage to stay upright in our chair? let alone get from your chair out of the room at the end of class. It's an open mystery. If your moves are limited, non-embodied approaches seem to work pretty well. If your moves are basically infinite like us, non-embodied approaches don't seem to work very well. Here's an embodied approach to planning. This is uh, one of the very first uh, autonomous robots that was built uh, back in the 1960s and into the 1970s. This is Shaky the robot. Uh, amazing engineering at the time. There is an onboard camera and there is an onboard computer. It was incredible at the time. Basically speaking, Shaky would be placed inside a room as you see here. Shaky would take some pictures with its camera and take those images and the uh, video stream and then process it in a computational model on board. The cartoon on the right here, I took this from a physics engine. There were no physics engines in 1966. It was a much simpler computer model. But basically, uh, Shaky would sense, it would model, it would make an imaginary version of what it thought the room looked like inside. And then using that model, it would plan, it would mentally rehearse different ways of moving. And there was a search process running on board Shaky that would pick the particular path that would lead it closest to the door without touching any of the obstacles placed in the room. Uh, there are some old videos of Shaky uh, on YouTube. You can go and watch. Um, the reason that Shaky is called Shaky is Shaky would sit for a few minutes, move about an inch and shake to a stop take another couple of images, process for a couple of minutes, take another step, move another inch, shake to a stop. And with uh, about 24, 36 hours, Shaky could find its way out of the room. Okay. Obviously, Shaky had quite a few cards stacked against it. It was using 1960s electronics. We could probably redo this today. And maybe you could make a 2022 version of Shaky that could build up a physics engine internally and rehearse actions and make its way out of a room more or less in real time without having to stop and think. But even with 2022 technology, this would be a tricky thing to, to do. Okay. Obviously, we don't work that way. When class ends, you're not gonna stand up and stand there for a minute, look around the room, take another step, see how you did at approaching the door to leave the room, maybe back up, take another step, right? It's effortless. Whatever you're doing is not this sense, model, plan, move cycle. Or is it? Again, thinking about thinking is misleading. Okay. 
We got five minutes left, so let's end with another building block of cognition, which the less controversial version of this is decision making, if that makes you feel more comfortable. The less comfortable interpretation of this building block is what we refer to as free will, right? You decide in five minutes time that you want to leave the room, you figure out how to do it, right? It's obvious. So uh, uh, in the 1980s, Libet and his colleagues performed the following experiment. How many people have heard of the Libet experiment before? Just a few people. Okay, great. So uh, this was nothing to do with robots. This was human psychology. Uh, Libet collected a bunch of human subjects and placed EEGs on their scalp. EEG is electroencephalography, so picking up electrical current on the surface of the brain. They also instrumented each of these human subjects with EMG sensors on their fingers, electromyography, which picks up electrical signals coming from the muscle fibers under the surface of the skin. Each human subject was placed in front of a clock. There used to be a clock in this room. There's no longer a clock in this room. They would look at a normal clock and they would watch the second hand <laughs> moving around the clock. And they were asked to freely choose a given point in time to move their finger. And when they chose to move their finger, that they actually moved their finger. So I'm watching the clock. Time is passing, time is passing. I choose to move. Watching the clock, watching the clock, watching the clock. I choose to move my finger. OK. Sounds like kind of an odd experiment. They performed this with a number of human uh, subjects. And the data looked pretty good. For all of these subjects, at the given point in time that they reported to have decided to move their finger. So they have to verbally report, when the second hand got to 14 seconds past the minute, that's when I decided. At that point in time, 200 milliseconds later, so 2 tenths of a second later, the AMG would light up. So it seems that most human subjects were obeying the rules of the experiment. Choose to move your finger, and it takes about 2 tenths of a second for commands from your brain to reach the tip of your finger. Everything looks pretty good. Then things got really, really weird. For all of the human subjects, if we lined up the moment at which they reported that they had freely chosen to move their finger, there was a particular EEG pattern, and that EEG pattern was different for different human subjects. Everyone's fingerprints are unique. Everybody's brain patterns are unique. But those patterns showed up 300 milliseconds later, and they always correlated with the EMG signal 200 uh, milliseconds after the, uh, after the choice had been made. So this, the human investigators were looking at all the EEG uh, over time, and it turns out that there was this one pattern that showed up, a unique pattern for each subject, that always correlated, that always predicted 500 seconds later, activation of EMG. Odd. From the point of view of the human subjects, they had decided to move their finger at 17 seconds past the minute, but a third, three tenths of a second before that, another part of their brain had made their decision for them. And not only did that happen, but they weren't aware of it. Okay, as you can imagine, that conclusion is deeply unsettling for a lot of people. It was extremely controversial. It's still controversial today. There have been many replications of this experiment. For those that are interested, go and read up on the Libet experiment. I just wanted to finish with this today. This is probably the most obvious reminder or warning that thinking about thinking is misleading. Introspection is dangerous. Aspects of intelligence that seem blindingly obvious, like the fact that you freely choose to stand up and leave the room, maybe they are not as obvious as they seem. One question before we break. Yeah, so in the reading it talked about it, maybe there is free will because you can veto the decision still. Possibly. But when, is the decision to veto also made in the same way where it's before? So there's the veto argument, right? You are free to veto candidate actions flowing up from your subconscious. But there is the problem of infinite regress. How did you freely choose to veto that action and not another one? 
Okay, more disquieting thoughts to leave you with today. You have a quiz due tonight. You're starting on assignment two. See you back here Thursday morning. Thanks very much, everybody.